Okay, now when we ended last week, we were looking at uh, Jesus' crucifixion in Mark 15, uh, verses 21 to 32, and I suggested to you that he was crucified sometime near the transition from mid-morning to midday. And I pointed out that I, I take Mark's statement that he was crucified at the third hour as a general reference to mid-morning. And John's statement that he was crucified about the sixth hour as a general reference to about midday. And I thought you might appreciate this, uh, this quote from Justin Taylor in his article, What Time Did Jesus Die? He says, when we come to, to that should be a passage like Mark 15, 25, it's probably best to understand the expression, the third hour, not as a precise reference to 9 a.m., which is how we would understand it. In fact, somebody pointed out to me the NIV says 9 o'clock. Okay, well, you can see how that might... Uh, so he says, not as a pre precise reference to 9 a.m., but as an approximate reference to mid-morning. From 7.30 or 8 to 10 or 10.30 a.m., likewise, the sixth hour could refer to any time from 10.30 or 11 to 1 to, or 1.30 Remember, the hours were rough approximations of the sun's position in a quadrant of the sky. If the sentencing was delivered, say, around 10.30, and two witnesses were to glance at the sun in the sky, one could round down to the third hour, one could round up to about the sixth hour, depending on other factors they might want to emphasize. For example, if John wants to highlight, in particular, the length of the proceedings and that the final verdict concerning the Lamb of God is not far off from the noontime slaughter of lambs for the Sabbath dinner of Passover week. Ultimately, there's no final contradiction, especially given the fact that John gives an approximation about of something that was not meant to be precise in the first place. So I point that out to you because that's something that you, you probably have run across, may run across, but I wanted to explain to you that's, that's how I see it, and I thought Taylor says that well. Now, a notice was placed on the cross... On the cross above Jesus' head, it was put there in three languages, and whether individually or in some combination, the statements, the notices included the statement, this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, he was crucified with the two outlaws or the two insurrectionists or rebels who probably had been arrested for rebellion and murder along with Barabbas and those passing by the public site of the crucifixion. That's where they would crucify people. As I mentioned last week, they'd do it publicly. Those passing by, they verbally abuse the Lord after all he's gone through. And they're there verbally abusing him and they're shaking their heads at him. You see, just real disgust. They're really a, a sign of contempt and derision. They're just shaking their heads at him. Just as indicated in Psalm 22 Seven. See, they turned on him. And right when we ended last week, I was mentioning this. They turned on him. They're angry. See, because he had, he had lifted their hopes. They thought that this was going to be the one. This was going to be something, a turning point. And then from their perspective, he's just killed. He's just killed like other people who were pretenders. And so they were just really angry with him. And just, you know heaping disgust on him. And then picking back up in verse 31, the chief priests and the scribes, they likewise are mocking Jesus among themselves. They deride him for what they perceive to be his inability to save himself. And they refer to him sarcastically as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. See, suggesting that if he really was that figure... If he truly were the Messiah, he would come down from the cross so they could see and believe him. Come on, the Messiah, he would simply just say, okay, I'm ending this. And so this is what they're saying. And the truth is that their hearts are hard. Their eyes are blind. No such sign is going to be given to them. And it wouldn't matter if it had been given. No such sign is going to be given. Even the outlaws crucified with him insult him. Now you see in Luke chapter 23, you see one of the outlaws apparently repents. But here Mark just reports they're uh, insulting him. 
So we have this sinless, holy, perfect, flawless, loving Son of God suffering for the salvation of people who abuse Him and hate Him. And He faces rejection and abandonment by people in His final hour. I mean, it's just really a tragic, you know, in a sense, a classic sense of this... Uh, Suffering that he's going through. Uh, so you have this. With, it's just, uh, I just think, very moving. And then in 33 to 41, darkness fell on the land from mid midday, sixth hour, to mid-afternoon, ninth hour. And as elsewhere in Scripture, darkness is indicative of divine judgment. That's what you, you can see that in Exodus 10, Isaiah 13, Joel, Amos. This idea, so this darkness comes on the land. Now, Mark doesn't explain the darkness. But the darkness could not be a solar eclipse. It couldn't be that because the Jews, they used the lunar calendar. And the 15th of Nisan, which is the day of Passover, that was a time of a full moon. And so that means, of course, that the earth then is between the sun and moon. When you have a full moon, you have the earth here, you have the sun on one side and the, and the moon on the other. You see, so for an eclipse, you need the moon between the earth, I mean, the, the earth and the sun. That's what causes the eclipse. So it cannot be a solar eclipse because it's a time of a full moon. Now, Thales, Thales was a Roman historian, Roman historian. Thales is a historian who apparently wrote a three-volume chronicle of world history in the mid-50s. Okay, so that's not too long after this is going down. He's writing this in the mid-50s. Now, that work has been lost. That happens to many works in history. We don't have an actual copy of Thales's Chronicles of World History. But we know about his work from other writers. For example, Eusebius, who was the... the uh, early Christian, early fourth century church historian. He lets us know about Thales' work. And then there's, before Eusebius, there is a third century Christian historian named Julius Africanus. And in the course of discussing the darkness that fell on the land during Jesus' crucifixion, Africanus writes, in the third book of his history, Thales calls this darkness an eclipse of the sun wrongly, in my opinion. So here we have this third century Christian referring to this Roman historian Thales who wrote in the 50s. And he's referring to the eclipse, the darkness that occurred during the Lord's crucifixion. And he's explaining, in a way, this Roman historian by saying it was an eclipse. Well, as, as Thales says, I mean, as Africanus says, wrongly in my opinion. And it would be wrong. It would be impossible. It couldn't be an eclipse. So here, Thales seems to acknowledge this odd, prolonged darkness through his attempt to explain it away. And I think that's interesting. Now, at the ninth hour, mid-afternoon, Jesus lets out a loud cry in Aramaic based on Psalm 22.1. And Mark reports, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. And Mark then translates that into Greek for his readers, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, in the, in the Lord's words, in reporting the Lord's words, Matthew, verse 27 to 46, he gives the opening address of my God, my God. He gives it in Hebrew. See, from Psalm 22, verse 1, he gives Eli, Eli, instead of Eloi, Eloi. So he takes the Hebrew of those things, and then he continues it in Aramaic. Okay, so he gives it first in Hebrew. And, the, and there are two main possibilities for what Jesus means in uttering these words. Two main possibilities. It was common in ancient Judaism to invoke an entire psalm simply by quoting the first line of it. 
In other words, if I just give you the first line, you know that what I'm saying is I'm citing the entire psalm. Now, that was common, a way of doing it. Now, if that's what Jesus is doing here, well, then rather than a cry of despair evoked by his sense of abandonment, well, then he's expressing hope and confidence in ultimate delivery. Brian P. or Brant Petrie in his book, The Case for Jesus, he says, when the whole psalm is taken into account, Jesus' words make crystal clear that although he appears to be forsaken in his suffering and death, in the end, God will hear him and save him. So see, that's one way of looking at it, is that he's really, that's just a, a signal of the psalm. And the psalm's point is, yes, it looks bad, but I know I'm being saved. I'm being rescued. Now, it's also possible, and I kind of favor this, it's, and they're not, they're not all that far apart, but I think it's possible that Jesus quoted Psalm 22.1 not simply as a shorthand reference to the ultimate vindication that's expressed in the psalm, but because he was experiencing the agony and the pain of forsakenness that David expresses in that particular verse. As Jesus receives the full weight of God's judgment against all the sins of the world, all sin of mankind, he takes on himself God's judgment of that as he becomes a curse for us. As Paul says in Galatians 3.13, as he is made sin for us, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he experiences a painful alienation from the Father and he cries out. Let me read to you what uh, Andreas Kostenberger and Justin Taylor say on that. He says, in some mysterious way, Beyond our human understanding, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is cut off and separated from God because he's bearing the sin of humanity and enduring God's wrath as a substitute for and in place of sinful humans. Of course, Jesus knows how Psalm 22 ends in vindication and may be reminding us that forsakenness is not the end of the story. That's why I said they're not that far apart. But the one has Jesus saying, you know, really, it's not so much of what I'm experiencing now, it's my vindication. The other focuses on what David is experiencing in the psalm and says, no, this is a cry from that experience. And I can see that, and I see the Lord uh, you know, it, it's just, what do we say? That Jesus endured that for us. That the perfect one was willing to endure that and take that. So I might be here. I might be in relationship with God. I might have the hope that I have. I might have fellowship with all of you. He did that. And that's what brings us together and that's what gives us what we have. Now some standing by, they misunderstand Jesus. They think that he's calling on the prophet Elijah. He's calling on Elijah to rescue him. And somebody runs over and fills a sponge with sour wine. Now John 19.29 says there was a jar of sour wine there. And that seems odd, but this was a, this was a standard drink of Roman soldiers. So, they, so they're there and they've got this, this jar of sour wine. And somebody runs over and, and fills a sponge with it puts it on a reed to be able to reach Jesus on the cross and gives it to him to drink. Now, according to John 19, 28 and 29, the offer of this sour wine, which it was a cheap vinegar wine that was heavily diluted with water. And as I say, it was a staple of the Roman military. This, this was precipitated, the person's giving this to Jesus was precipitated by Jesus' statement I thirst. And so then in John 19, you see then it's followed with this presentation. And John 19, 30 says that Jesus received it, which means he actually took it and drank it. Now, when I think about it, I say, given how the passers-by, the religious leaders, and even the outlaws, given how they were reviling Jesus 
in Mark 15, 29 to 32. This offer of sour wine, you have to say, well, what's the motivation for it? Is this somehow all of a sudden somebody's had a change of heart and it's an act of compassion? Or is this a continuation of the hostility and the mocking? And there's a, you know, obviously a split on it. People see things differently. Most people, and I think this is probably right, see it as a continuation of the hostility and the mocking. You see something along the lines of offering it to him laughingly saying, let's see if Elijah will rescue him. If his life is prolonged just a moment longer by this wine. You see, but it, it could be. I mean, you could look at it and say, well, no, it was an act of compassion. So you say, well, all right, but if it's not an act of compassion, if this is something where the people are being hostile and they're continuing to mock him, well, then why does Jesus accept it here when he refused the earlier attempts to mock him, when they gave him the, the wine mixed with myrrh? And, oh, no, here, this is, this is really ritzy stuff. Here, O king, drink it. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. And I suggested to you the reason he wouldn't have anything to do with it was because he wasn't going to participate in the mockery. Well, if what I'm saying to you now, the mockery is continuing with this, why here would he accept it and not before? Okay? Uh, and I think it's possible that they are, in fact, in fact, I think it's likely they're mocking him. And I think the reason he accepted is because he's right now at death's door. I think now is a time he's ready, he's ready to die. And he's doing this to symbolize his taking on himself in his death all of the sin and the rejection and the hatred and the hostility and the abuse of God by mankind. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's taking on himself all of our rage and hatred toward God and abuse of God, treating God like he's a joke. And now as he's ready to pass, he's willing to say, I will take this because that simply illustrates, exemplifies the hostility and the hatred that I'm bearing. And so maybe that's it. But as I say, it's possible there's somebody in the crowd that's doing it out of compassion. You're just not told. So you're left then to try to uh, piece things together and see what do you think makes the most sense. Now Jesus he lets out a loud cry, and then he dies. Now, crucifixion victims, they normally didn't have the strength to speak by the time they were at the point of death. I mean, this was absolutely horrific, dying this way. And they didn't typically have the strength to speak like that. So the fact Jesus cries out loudly, that points to his being in control of his faculties and giving himself up to die. Do you think anybody's going to kill the Lord if the Lord doesn't want to? You see, he's giving himself up to die. According to Luke 23, 46 and John 19, 30, the content of the Lord's final cry was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. And you think you want the pivot point of existence? You want the pivot point of creation? The pivot point of all reality? Right there. It is finished. God the Son bearing in himself all of the hostility and hatred and rage and abuse and mocking and sin, all of that. He drinks the cup dry that you and I might be reconciled to God. You and I might have eternity with God. You and I might have fellowship with one another as fellow cleansed sinners. And so it's just a tremendous, tremendous thing. And as Jesus dies, the curtain in the temple is torn Top to bottom, not bottom to top. It's torn top to bottom, and that signifies that it was torn miraculously by God because it started at top. And this tearing, it's noted in all of the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, this tearing of the curtains noted there. But none of them specifies or explains the significance of the tearing. And none of them specifies whether it was the outer curtain that separated the holy place from the surrounding courtyard, or whether it was the inner curtain. 
that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So they just don't, they don't tell you that. Now the tearing of the inner curtain in conjunction with Jesus' death, if that's the curtain that's teared, which seems likely to me just for theological reasons. But if it's the tearing of that curtain that separates the holy place from the most holy place, well then his death is, is showing a way, a new kind of access to God for mankind. That's the symbol of that. That here is God symbolized here in the Holy of Holies. And now this is split and rip, ripped open by God, symbolizing this new access, an access that was not tied to the sacrificial Jewish system. And so that makes a great deal of sense. But either of the curtains, the tearing of either of the curtains, may have foreshadowed the later fulfillment of Jesus' words that the temple would be destroyed. You remember Jesus said that. The temple was going to be taken down. And so this could have just been an indication, a confirmation of what he'd said. And when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus says, saw how he died, and he saw how he died, saw the way that he conducted himself in death, all of the events surrounding his death, he exclaimed, truly, this man was the son of God. Now that's powerful. That's powerful. This Gentile, this hated, despised, occupying Roman soldier, this person is able to grasp to a significant degree the truth of Jesus' identity. A truth that the Jewish relig religious leaders refused to see. It's not that they couldn't see it. They refused to see it. And that's the way this world is set up. You see, the, the indications were there. The indications were there. But those with hard hearts found reasons not to believe. And I tell people, see, this is how this reality is set up. That if you, God has left room, that if you are bent on hiding and you want to be God, you can always rationalize it. You can always do it. You know, uh, I think it was McGuigan many years ago I heard, that, you know, don't you think that God could say, boom out in a loud voice to people all over the world. People, this is God. For the next 30 seconds, there'll be no air. And then you're sitting there going, he says, don't you think he could make people? Yeah, he could. But he hasn't done it that way. You see, he's left it so that there is room for people who don't want to rationalize in their own mind. Here you have this Roman soldier who says, it's plain enough to me. And yet you have all these religious leaders saying, kill him, kill him. And there's even more coming. And what will they do with that? You think, oh no, there's more coming now and that will certainly convince them. And they will then in mass embrace the lordship of Jesus. No, certainly there are Jews who do. That is the root of the church. But many, many will not. And it's because they don't want to. They find reasons not to. Now Mark identifies three women who at the time that Mark is reporting, they're watching from a distance. See, they had followed Jesus and administered to him when he was in Galilee. And now with many other women, they had come with him to Jerusalem. Now John 19, 25 and 26 indicates that at some point during the crucifixion, four women were near the cross. You see, Mark reports in Matthew that there are three standing at a distance from the cross, but we have John saying there are four women near the cross. Well, what's going on with that? Well, perhaps three of these women that John reports as being near the cross, perhaps they moved back to observe the Lord's suffering at a distance after Jesus committed his mother to John's care, who may have then taken her away from the scene and then returned, that she had seen enough and that he wanted to get her away. Jesus gives his mother into John's care. 
They're all there near the cross. John takes her away, comes back, and then the women stand at a distance. Okay, so this is what I think is quite possibly going on. And we have the women here. Mary the Magdalene is probably, probably means that she's from Magdala, which is a small fishing village on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. She's the most prominent of Jesus' female followers. And according to Luke 18, 2, she was a woman from whom Jesus, or from whom seven demons had been cast out. And that presumably was by the power of the Lord. Because, you know, he's casting out demons a lot. And so she was a woman from whom seven had been cast out, presumably by the Lord. And there's no reason to think that she was a prostitute or that she was especially immoral. That notion that typically gets mixed up, it gets, her identity gets confused with other women in the Gospels. But here we have this woman who is following Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and we have Mary the mother of James the Lesser, or James the Younger, and Joses, or Joseph. Mary the mother of James the Lesser, and Joseph. She appears to be the woman, now I say this, you can't be certain of this because Mary's very common name. Uh, you have a lot of different women who are there, okay? But the fact we've got Matthew talking about, Mark gives us three women, Matthew gives us three women, John has four, and Mary, the, the Lord's mother is one of them, and then she's not in these three. Okay, this woman, the mother of James the Lesser, and Joseph appears to be the woman that John identifies in, in John 19.25 as Mary, the wife of Clopas. Okay, not airtight. Can't, she can't, you know, but it looks that way. That he identifies her as, as uh, the wife of Clopas. Now, it's possible that Mary's son, James, when it says James, the lesser or younger, it's possible that her son is James, the lesser of the apostles. The lesser apostle James. You see, the one who's identified in Mark chapter 3, verse 18, is James, the son of Alphaeus. And if you're with me, you're thinking, well, wait a minute. How is she the wife of Clopas and the mother of James, the son of Alphaeus? You think, how can that be possible? Well, there are a couple ways it could be possible. You see, Clopas and Alphaeus can be two different ways of transliterating the Aramaic name. And it just depends on how in the opening word, whether you give it a hard, that this guttural, whether you give it a hard sound, a k, or whether you give it a soft sound, a k. You see, so it's possible, and this is what John Wenham's claim, it's possible that that would be just the same Aramaic name transliterated two different ways, but it's also possible that Clopas could be the stepfather of James. Okay, so although I'm not telling you that this is take it to the bank, there's no bar to, uh, to Mary, the mother of James, the lesser being Mary, the wife of Clopas, and they seem to be connected in my judgment. Now, Salome is the third one, may be identified in, Mark 20, in Matthew 27, 56 as the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Okay, now that's interesting. If, if, if we're tracking this right, if we're talking about the same individuals, and we can't be sure of that, but if, if we are talking about the same individuals, well, then Salome may be identified in 27. She, well, if, we, if they're the same, she would be. In 2756, as the mother of, of the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and is possibly the sister of the Virgin Mary, who's referred to in John 1925. Okay? But as I said, can't be sure. But now, if what I'm saying to you, if these things are right, if these are all the same women, then you wind up with this, learning this that you have Mary Magdalene, then you have Mary's the mother of James the lesser, and Joseph, and is also the wife of Clopas, this lesser James could be the lesser known apostle James, the son of Alphaeus. Salome is the mother of the sons of Zebedee, and is also the Virgin Mary's sister. Okay, so as I say, uh, is that correct? All I'll leave you with is I think it may be. Okay, I think it may be. Now, we get to the Lord's burial. In, in 1542 to 47. Now, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, requires the body of an executed criminal, requires the body of an executed criminal to be buried on the day of his death. 
And it indicates that a failure to do that defiles the land. So if you've got somebody executed, criminal, he needs to be buried on the day of his death. And the desire to avoid that consequence of defiling the land, that would be elevated during the Passover week. They would be even more sensitive to not wanting to defile the land during the Passover week. And because, it, because nightfall was approaching, okay, we're getting, and which is the beginning of the next day, because nightfall was approaching and therefore the beginning of the next day, which was the Sabbath of the Passover week. So we're there. That, that day's beginning. Joseph of Arimathea, he courageously goes to Pilate and he asks for Jesus' body for burial. Now here's what Kostenberger and and Justin Taylor, they kind of summarize something about Joseph of Arimathea from information drawn throughout the New Testament. He says, Joseph was a rich man who was a member of the Sanhedrin and a secret disciple of Jesus. While being a high-standing member of the Jewish community, he had not consented to the ruling council's decision, whether he was absent or that all, when it said all of them, whether that was hyperbole. He says, Joseph was a good and righteous man who was actively looking for the kingdom of God. His request to bury Jesus required a good deal of courage since it makes his sympathy for Jesus public at a time which such sympathy could be dangerous. You're right, it could be. <laughs> they just killed this guy. And you're going to go over here and risk identification with him. Well, why, do you, why do you care? Why, why do you, does he mean something to you? You see? So it was quite a courageous act for him to do that. Now, Pilate, Pilate was surprised that Jesus had already died. And the reason he was surprised is that crucifixion normally was a real, long, drawn-out agony. It went on and on. That's part of why it was so horrible. I mean, you know, give me a bullet in the head. But don't do this kind of stuff. And yet that's what the Lord, just from a physical perspective, that's what he took. And so he was surprised, you know, that he's, that he's already dead. So he summoned the centurion to confirm that he was dead, which he did. And I always get a kick out of these people and say, well, Jesus didn't really die. I'm thinking, what kind of moron do you think these Roman people are? You think they never know? These guys who kill people all the time. No, no, no. They've never seen an unconscious person. They didn't know you could be unconscious and not dead. No, no, no. As soon as you close your eyes and did that, okay, he's dead. I mean, it's just crazy. And yet this kind of stuff gets pumped out as though it's insightful. And I look and I say it's moronic. Of course this person understood what it means to be dead. And you think he's going to go back to Pilate, the top guy, and say, by the way, yeah, I confirmed it on your request. He's in fact dead. I'm telling you, he would have made sure he was dead. He's not going to go back and say, by the way, yeah, I gave him the once over. I looked at him for 50 feet. Trust me, he's dead. No. When Pilate says, you go tell him, you make sure he's dead. Oh, they made sure he was dead. And he is dead. You see, he's dead. And then Pilate then, then grants Joseph the right to Jesus' corpse. And his willingness to do so, it might be related to his view that Jesus was an innocent victim of the Jewish leadership. Remember, he recognized what was going on. He thought, man, I, you want me to give you Jesus? And they stirred up. Everybody said, no, we want Barabbas. Well, he knew what was going on. He was just spineless. He was a politician. He didn't care. I'll kill an innocent guy. If it helps keep peace and it helps me in what I want, I don't care about killing somebody. But he knew what they were doing. And so that may have been a factor. And you think, why would he give his body? Well, maybe that's it. Maybe it's a little thumb to them on the way out. <laughs> Say, yeah, I let you have him crucified, him, but I'm giving this guy the body. So he does that. Now, Mark reports that Joseph placed Jesus in a rock tomb, wrapped in a linen cloth, and being wealthy... He no doubt had assistance in doing that from many servants. Okay, and, and so if, if Mark doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's just how it works. If I tell you here, do this, and I'm the, I'm the boss, you're my servant, he says he did it. I just can't imagine the wealthy guy not having servants to help him. Okay, but in any event, he winds up placing him there in that rock tomb. 
And Matthew also reports the, Matthew reports the appointment of a Roman guard. Matthew says that the tomb was new. They put him in the tomb. After doing that, a stone was rolled against the, the entrance to secure it. Matthew says that the tomb was new. Luke mentions that no one had yet been laid in it. And I'm just thinking, remember like the, the colt that was ridden? No one had ridden that colt. Why? Because the Lord is too significant. What he's doing is too significant to share that colt with anyone. And I think that's the case with the tomb. No one had been laid in that tomb because no tomb that had been used by anybody else was fitting for the Lord. Now, they don't say all that. I'm just giving you that. That's what I think is going on. So nobody had been laid at. John mentions both of those things, and he adds that it was near the place of the crucifixion. Now, that's an important little piece of information. So we know the, cruci if we know the crucifixion site. You see, now we know that the tomb is near that. As I said, I think both of these things are in what in uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. I think there's a very good case that we do, in fact, know where, where the site of crucifixion is and where the tomb is. But Matthew reports an appointment of a Roman guard at the tomb. And then John adds that, that Joseph was aided in the burial by Nicodemus. You see in John 19, 38, 42, who in John 3, 1, he's described as a ruler of the Jews. That's how Nicodemus is described, meaning that he too was a member of the Sanhedrin. So we have both of them as members of the Sanhedrin. And he contributes this huge mixture of myrrh and aloes that are designed to cover the stench of decomposition because bodies stink when they rot. And this was part of the process of covering that. And this was wrapped in the linen in accordance with Jewish burial customs, it says in John 19.40. Now Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph and James the lesser, that's implied, they observed where Jesus' body was laid. I mean, they saw the location of the tomb. That's first bell or second bell? All right. They saw that they saw the, I guess I should look up there, huh? Oh, yeah. All right. They saw the location of the tomb. And then they, or perhaps other women, like Joanna and Susanna, they also saw where in the tomb the body was positioned. You see that in Luke 23, 55. Now, they're going to return to the tomb. So they spot this, and they're going to return to the tomb to anoint the body when the Sabbath is over. Okay, because they're not going to be doing that on Sabbath. They'll return to do that when the Sabbath is over, and they will serve as key witnesses to the resurrection. And that's going to be important, the fact that women are key witnesses to the empty tomb. That's important apologetically, as I'll, I've explained before, but I'll explain later. All right, now we have... Uh, we get to 16, and here the women, they, they prepare for this journey. They're going to return, and they're going to anoint the body. And after the Sabbath ended, which, see, the Sabbath ends, which is sunset on Saturday, right? Jewish day begins at sunset. So that's now the beginning of Sunday, the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome, they purchase spices from a shop, so they could go and anoint Jesus at daybreak. So when the sun goes down, Sabbath is over, shops open so they can do business. They go out and buy the spices, intending when it gets light, they're going to go to the tomb. And so they're ready, and they're going to do that. Maybe they wanted to add their own anointing. You say, why are they doing that? They've already put tons of myrrh and aloe on him. Why do they want to do that? Well, maybe they wanted to add their own anointing. Maybe they just wanted to have this expression of love and devotion. They say, I know that, but I want to do it. Maybe that's how they felt. Okay, maybe that's what, what they're doing. They want to do that despite that prior application by Joseph and Nicodemus or their servants. And perhaps when they left on Friday, maybe they confirmed where the tomb was. They confirmed the position of his body, where it was laid. Maybe they were under the impression that the anointing wasn't going to be done until after the Sabbath. Okay, so I, I don't know. You know, these things 
you would love to be able to go back and say, now why this, why that? And we're left with what we're left with, and we try to think. Well, what's going on here? We know that what God tells us is true, and then from that we try to say, okay, what, what could explain that? And so that's what I think may be going on. It's either their own devotion, they thought it wasn't going uh, to be done until the next day, and they'd come and join that. And it seems that their trip to the tomb, it began just before sunrise on Sunday, which is the first day of the week. So it, it begins before sunrise when it's still rather dark, you see in John chapter 20, verse 1. But it's light enough to navigate. So whether the sun is still below and is, is already starting to do something or whether it's from the light you get of the full moon, uh, but there's enough light for them to start out to head to the tomb before the sun has actually broken the surface and the sun then breaks the horizon during their journey there. And in their grief, they hadn't thought about who's going to move this huge stone. Now people think, how is that possible? Look, Older I get, I can see that every second, right? I mean, it's just not thinking about it. And so they're on the way to the tomb, and when they're on the way, then it dawns and they go, oh, you've never been somebody who you travel somewhere and go, oh, what about that? All right, well, yeah. How did that slip everybody's mind? It did. And now they're saying, well, how are we going to move the, how are we going to move the stone? This stone is huge. And I did hear that bell. So thank you for coming. Lord willing, next week we'll finish the gospel according to Mark.